Hey everybody and welcome to another Mortgage Coach Tuesday call. Every Tuesday we are here to deliver inspiration to help you think differently and execute your business at a higher level. Uh, sometimes I bring it in a top loan officer, uh, but one thing for sure, we are passionate about leveraging technology to help educate families at a higher level. So everybody on this call, you have something in common. You are all mortgage coaches. Uh, some of you are executing on that standard at a really high level, some of you aren't, uh, but that's our mission. It's to get every time someone gets into debt, into mortgage debt that is, they're getting a total cost analysis. Now, um, today's guest is new to the mortgage coach community. As most of you know, we started bragging about this, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, but uh, the stats of the top 1% mortgage professionals came out and we, we ran the numbers and 34% of them are powered by mortgage coach. Uh, I'm going to talk about next week's call in a minute because it's going to be kind of cool. I'm going to be interviewing some of the best loan officers in America that are mortgage coaches. Uh, but you know, this call is all about leveraging digital technology more effectively, like many of the top lenders are already doing. Um, you know, next week is a really important call, so make sure you're checking our online calendar. It's you know we're updating it weekly, but I, I just put this call together. So next week I'm going to be bringing in Josh Metal. His team helped over 600, well, they helped 628 families last year. So one of the most effective mortgage professionals in the industry. Wally out of Dallas helped 328 families last year. Kelly Zitlow out of, out of um, Scottsdale, Arizona provided hundreds of total cost analysis. I love her mission. My mission is to deliver an honest, well-communicated, knowledge-based lending experience. Um, the, Hansen, the Gaylord Hansen team out of San Diego is going to be on the call and one of the top 100 loan officers in the country, Rick Shear. So we're going to have a, an incredible call next Tuesday. Also, I'm going to be doing a special Wednesday call next week. So Wednesday, I'm going to be interviewing Jocko, uh, the author of Extreme Ownership, um, former Navy SEAL commander who has also led one of, you know, is one of the leaders at Prospect. So he obviously brings an interesting perspective to how to execute in today's market. So next week is big, guys. Uh, make sure that you, you let your teams know and let's fill it up next week. Uh, do you want to remind everybody these calls are recorded. This call will be recorded. And today I'm bringing in the first time into the mortgage coach community, but second time I've had the, the pleasure to speak with Michael Chong. Michael, welcome to the call. Hey, thank you, Dave. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Well, hey. Michael, I, I was blown away with your presentation at the Mortgage Collaborative Conference in, uh, where was that, Tucson, Arizona, several months ago. Uh, I, as everybody on this call knows, I'm, I'm big around using technology to add value in service uh, in the mortgage industry. But mm -hmm. Michael has a, has a great presentation. I'm going to let him do most of his introduction, but you know, this is a guy who has built brands. You know, he was the, one of the founders of Mac Week. I'll let him tell his story in more detail, but someone that is a, a change agent and someone that's studying the market. So Michael, I'm going to pass the screen to you, let you uh, kind of set the table. Uh, folks, there will be some opportunity for some Q&A on this call, so feel free to be submitting questions throughout the conversation in the GoToMeeting control panel. And Michael is going gonna, is gonna to tell us about Uber Trends and how technology is changing the market. Great. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, a little bit of background on me. Uh, I am a, a, a five-time entrepreneur. I've done uh, four startups working on my fifth. I am a innovation and trend speaker. I've been speaking professionally for about 18 years now. And I also have a, um, a professorship at both the University of San Francisco as well as UC Berkeley specializing in, in now, you, uh, if you're on Twitter uh, and feel like tweeting during the session, you're welcome to. My handle is uh, at Ubercool, so uh, please feel free to do so. Um, now, you probably are uh, going to wonder, uh, how does he teach innovation? Well, I, I brought a couple of pics with me, so you can see. <laughs> uh, here I have two classes, uh, uh, hard at work on challenges that uh, help them go through the process of, of you know, creating breakthrough innovation um, at their organization. 
And uh, I do so by focusing on four tried and true techniques. Uh, Distilled, of course, for your convenience, because there are probably more, but these are the core ones. Uh, first one is challenge orthodoxies, uh, fancy terminology for basically think creative. Uh, identify unmet needs. Uh, certainly, this is something we all do in our business, but you know, uh, this is a platform for innovation because pain points are what drives a lot of uh, thought. Uh, uh, towards uh, breakthrough innovations. Leverage resources. If you're a larger corporation, you have many of those. If you're a smaller company, uh, I always advocate looking towards Silicon Valley and borrowing some of their ideas in terms of, you know, things that you could use to help you create that breakthrough thought process, i.e. incubators, hackathons, uh, those type of ideas. And then finally, trend waves. Uh, I, I've been a trend watcher for a long period of time, and um, all of my startups have uh, wrote, writ, uh, written early waves, uh, be it desktop publishing, CRM, internet research, or online marketing. So uh, it's always great to be able to uh, ride an early wave because to me that is what you really want to be uh, on it creates a platform for disruption. And that's a lesson that I keep uh, teaching in all of my presentations because, you know, disruption equals opportunity. And there's a lot of uh, ability for you to disrupt because right now we are in the midst of some massive waves, which I call Uber trends. And an Uber trend is literally a wave that cascades to society, leaving many subtrends in its wake. And uh, it's this type of trend that really is significant in that it is so disruptive that it changes behavior, it changes values in the population. And these value changes are what allow a lot of startups and, uh, and mainstream businesses to to create new uh, new business opportunities, and that's what makes uh, an Uber trend so significant. Now, I track eight Uber trends, and uh, I'm going to focus on just a few here uh, due to time limitations. Obviously, uh, the biggest one I track is the digital lifestyle or the marriage of man and machine. Uh, as I like to say, uh, the computer is becoming us, and we're becoming the computer. Humans and machines are on a convergence path. And if you don't believe me, when you get tired, you crash. And you love to multitask. And uh, because you multitask so much, you're forgetting more, so you need memory protection. And those are three core traits of the CPU or the central processing unit of a computer. And as you can tell, we are on that convergence path. And that is something that is very significant because, again, the digital lifestyle is perhaps the largest Uber trend I track. And this, this, this digital lifestyle has us falling in love with machines. <laughs> if you have seen the movie Her, uh, you know of which I speak, and this is what this research study alludes to, uh, the fact that 64% of Americans, and these are probably more technology proficient ones, but that means that essentially it's a preview of things to come, is that it shows you uh, how open we are to having technology assist us to a, a higher level, so much so that we're willing to uh, to, to stake our, our, our love uh, on them. <laughs> and that's something that I think we're going to see a heck of a lot more of because, again, the advancements in technology, uh, specifically machine learning and robotics, is, is nothing uh, but short of amazing. Um, we are seeing that incursion of robotics already in the uh, hotel and hospitality trades where they're starting to show up. Um, if you go to the Aloft Hotel in Cupertino, California, you'll be met by Butler, the robot bellhop, uh, the relay team, the people behind this robot just uh, announced that uh, these robots have already made 11,000 guest deliveries 
So that gives you an inkling of the type of impact uh, robotics will have on the hospitality trade. Uh, similarly, if you now go to the McLean, Virginia Hilton Hotel, you'll be met by Connie, the robot uh, desk clerk. <laughs> and Connie was named after Conrad Hilton, uh, the founder of the Hilton Hotel chain. So again, a huge amount of impact uh, these robots are having. Now you're probably saying, you know, well, what type of impact will that have on my business? Well, the good news is a British research firm believes that by 2030, robots will start to replace lawyers. <laughs> so um, I think it will have a lot of impact on your immediate business. Uh, this is a kind of a proxy for uh, the incursion uh, robotics and, and perhaps less robots but more machine learning, i.e. Uh, using that old terminology, artificial intelligence uh, will have on all our businesses because anything that is very manually uh, intensive uh, is being replaced. And you can already see that obviously in, uh, in the areas of automotive assembly. Uh, a few weeks ago I shared a great little animated GIF that shows you how the Tesla robots are assembling uh, cars. Um, but there's also great videos on YouTube that show how uh, Amazon uses pick and pack robots to completely uh, mechanize its delivery of packages. And that's the type of thing that, you know, again, is going to have a huge impact on our workforce, the profile of the workforce, and what's going to happen in the near future. Hey, Michael? Yes. Hey, I want to jump in on that slide because, folks, I also, most of you get Rob Christman's daily newsletter and anybody that got it last Wednesday, the opening paragraph talked about how Intel is cutting its labor force by 1,200 um, folks because of slump in PC demand. And in the same sentence, they talked about how Citibank projects staff cut by 30% by 2025 because of the anticipation of more digital channels away from branch. So. You know, those are two stats that just hit our industry last week, and I think they really they make the point. You know, they it's it's it makes the point in the mortgage industry. I just wanted to throw them out there, Michael. Yeah, 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 and and I think the intel. No, I don't think it's twelve hundred. It's a lot, a lot of people. A twelve thousand, by the way, twelve thousand. Yeah, ten okay. percent of their sales force. Twelve thousand. Sorry about that. Yeah. So that is, you know, and again, uh, you know, Intel missed the boat completely on the mobile revolution. So to a large extent, you can't really directly blame that trend on robotics per se, but my sense is that, you know, this is the kind of pattern we're going to see throughout uh, the world as we get far more uh, uh, better startups, and I'll talk a little bit about that, who are more focused on the pain points of today as opposed to, you know, wanting to be another Me Too Facebook, uh, et cetera, which is, you know, the way Silicon Valley has tended to work, which is uh, Me Too investments. So, um, so a thought starter for the digital lifestyle is that it's rewriting the rules of innovation. And if you think about it, you know, uh, the, fa the technology is becoming interwoven with the fabric of life. And it's something that he, uh, is changing the way we value uh, what's important to us. And, and the, the values that, that have become paramount to Americans are connectivity, convergence, and convenience. And those are the three C's that I think um, rule digital lifestyle offerings. And it is that type of, 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 of value change that sets off huge disruptions in the industry. If you can think of a great uh, example of this that affects the retail industry, it's unquestionably Airbnb. Because if you think about it, what Airbnb has given the homeowner is uh, what the airlines have enjoyed for years. They call it seat optimization, I call it home optimization. Uh, you have excess inventory and you can now auction it off seamlessly via the web to people who are willing to pay for that room or entire apartment or house. And the fact that they've already hosted 70 million guests gives you an inkling of the huge impact this platform has had 
um, on the world at large. 70 million guests makes Airbnb the world's largest hotel chain by far. And it is this type of, you know, seamlessness, you see it already, connectivity, convergence, convenience, all of this rolled into one um, is what's going to revolutionize the travel industry. And Airbnb is the topic of conversation at every travel conference I've spoken at. Everyone is very, very concerned about the impact they're having. And of course, 70 million guests says, yes, that's 70 million guests that did not stay in a hotel room, right? Okay. Now let's talk about Unwired. Unwired is an Uber trend that, as the name suggests, is all about untethering. Disconnecting from wires, disconnecting from relationship, disconnecting from anything that is a controlling force. And, and that's why I also tend to refer to it as the control freak generation, because it is something that allows us to um, to uh, better control our processes. Now, of course, the biggest platform uh, uh, of change in the unwired Uber trend is the smartphone. Um, as I always like to say, June 29, 2007, the day that you know revolutionized our world, it's the day the iPhone went on sale, 800 million have been sold. And how has our lives changed? And how have our lives changed in the past nine years? If you think about it, it's it's the the, the changes have been absolutely staggering, and uh, it, it it's all being brought about by the apps. It's all about the apps, you know. Uh, you mention something, and there's an app for that. You know, whether it's controlling your car or controlling your barbecue or controlling your web server. All of that can be now accomplished from uh, the convenience of your phone, and, and those and that and that uh, power the apps provide is is unbridled. I mean, it's just going sky high. Um, I love the fact that a few weeks ago, Veritas Genetics uh, introduced a genome sequencing app that, for a thousand dollars, allows you to do something that in 2001 cost $3.7 billion. And I always have to bring these type of examples to the forefront because you have to think for a moment, in 15 years time, we have reduced something so massively complex, massively complex, to a simple smartphone app. And that gives you an inkling of, like I said, the mechanization power that is going to come down the pike. Uh, 15 years is a long time. Yes, I do agree, but at the same time, the uh, the, the advances are, are are a quantum leap ahead of what used to be. So, Unwired is creating a highly mobile and independent lifestyle. Now, uh, these are very condensed. Uh, Dave, who saw me speak, knows that I have far more examples that help you substantiate what what's behind each Uber trend. But I have to keep it short here, so I'm going to give you just the highlights. Uh, but the, the, the driving force behind Unwired is America's favorite value, and that's freedom. And that's freedom to decide when, where, and how. And, and, and you got to think control free because what's happening is that um, as more consumers and business customers get a, a familiar and, 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 and spoiled, if you will, by the power these apps provide, they're going to demand more of it. They want more of that type of power. And that is the type of thing that you know we're going to see more of. So that's why I think that you might you might say control freak is is too strong a word. Uh, I love the uh, I love the national car rental ad where he says control enthusiast and that perhaps might be something that fits that profile better. But whatever it is, we are all going to become control enthusiasts. And a great example of a business that totally leverages control enthusiasm is Uber. <laughs> Uber is valued at more than $60 billion. Why? Not because it's cheaper, not because it's uh, you know, uh, 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 available on your app, but what it really is is that it, is, it gives you the ability to accurately predict the arrival of your car by the icon on that little screen and the estimated ETA. It is control freak delight. I mean, how many times have you not waited for a cab 
to take you to the airport and you've got to call the dispatcher to find out what time are they arriving? Uh, you know, what time is this cab going to be here? And you get it, and to, invariably the dispatcher will say something like 20 minutes and 20 minutes can mean 5, it can mean 40, you have no idea. There is no control over the process, yet Uber provides that and that I see as its biggest, biggest benefit. Now you're seeing this type of, uh, of, of control enthusiasm also spread throughout the real estate industry and it's coming through you know things that you may not have noticed right away. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about WeWork which is the collaborative office space uh, rental firm. Uh, they're valued at a staggering 16 billion dollars so they're definitely a Silicon Valley unicorn. Um, but what WeWork does is it provides a solution to people such as myself, which is I'm a startup guy, I am in a collaborative workspace here in Las Vegas, and I love it because it gives me that freedom, the freedom to not have to sign a lease. And this is, again, revolutionizing real estate because as these type of principles spread, Throughout the, uh, throughout the industry, you're going to see a huge impact on the office rental market. Again, this is now being you know, used by maybe 1 or 2 percent of the, the business population, but again, these concepts are spreading and it is the control freedom that makes them so attractive. And that same principle is spreading to the whole market, that collaborative living I know, hippie lifestyle, commune, you might want to label it whatever you like, but the reality is if you can live in, in Brooklyn or Washington DC or in LA, which was uh, the early markets for these collaborative workspaces, and, and you've got the beautiful deck, and you've got the billiard table, you've got all of those Silicon Valley startup things that you can share with others. Uh, and, and you don't have to worry about an office lease, which gives you more mobility, and more mobility means more freedom, and what is freedom all about but the unwired Uber trend. So these types of things are going to revolutionize the real estate market. Now let's talk about innovation um, for a moment. Trends and case studies um, are, are what I want to focus on a bit here. One, one of the things that has changed is that uh, and I, I usually, you know, have more time, I do a pop quiz, I ask people, can you think of uh, 10 innovative companies in America? And, uh, you know, uh, the audience will go through a list, Facebook, uh, Google, you know, Amazon, what have you. Uh, and I inevitably say, you know, look, most of them are technology companies that you have just mentioned, uh, and, and, and you're having a hard time going beyond, say, six, seven, most people can't even get to 10. And, and, and that is unbelievable given the fact that there are 240 million businesses in the Dun & Bradstreet database worldwide. Uh, we obviously need a lot more innovation and that mindset has luckily changed starting in the 90s uh, and certainly by the uh, staggeringly fantastic example that Apple has given us going from a loss-making company in 2001 when it lost $3 billion in revenues to the world's most valuable corporation in the time span of a little over a decade is perhaps the best case study ever about the value that innovation provides. So by 2014, we've got this global survey of 4,000 companies that shows you that innovation right now is tied with quality at the top two values that drive corporate uh, growth and driver of values in enterprises. So this is the type of thing that you know I try to elicit. And again, there's many more examples I can give. Uh, the best examples of uh, successful innovation case studies are Starbucks and Domino's, with both providing, you know, in Domino's case, quadruple the industry growth rate. The pizza industry is growing at about three percent. Uh, Domino's revenues are growing at 12 percent, and it's that type of. Uh, and, and Starbucks just announced another record-setting quarter. Um, you know, these people uh, uh, practice relentless innovation and it shows on the bottom line. Uh, here's another fantastic proxy that I want to point out. So after this session, please run over to your LinkedIn profile and immediately uh, update it to add innovative or innovator or innovation. <laughs> 
to your profile because as you can tell, uh, I've been doing this since August of 10. Uh, uh, the number of people with the t chief innovation officer in its entirety on LinkedIn has absolutely exploded. And in fact, the last time I looked at this, I look, you know, I, I went back and counted the first 20 pages of results, and what I saw was a huge amount of hybridization of titles: chief strategy and innovation officer, chief marketing and innovation officer. So. This gives you an inkling of the value and the importance and the popularity and the buzz that innovation is now driving in the marketplace. Let's talk about fintech. Fintech is your, uh, your industry. It's financial technology startups, uh, you know, uh, and um, it is a very hyperactive segment of the marketplace right now. Uh, you probably saw the Rocket Mortgage ad on the Super Bowl and all the discussion it, it, it elicited on Twitter afterwards. Uh, much of it uh, negative, but the bottom line is uh, Rocket Mortgage is a solution that addresses a pervasive pain point, and that is it is very hard to get a mortgage and manage the process. So the fact that Quicken Loans can some make this somewhat seamless is kudos to them. I mean, it's a preview of things to come. And you're seeing a heck of a lot more activity in this industry. Uh, just some screenshots of people that are playing out there, be it Lenda uh, or Lending Home, who says they can do loans in a matter of days instead of uh, of, 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 of months and uh, uh, weeks rather and, and, and have also had the ability to 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 close on, on over a hundred million dollars in finance and gives you an inkling of the type of activity we're seeing out there in this particular fintech category. Sinio is another one. Um, there are 12 startups in this segment specifically focused on the mortgage industry so keep in mind there's a lot of activity going on in the out. And this is something that uh, you know is going to. to uh, uh, the, the, right now, their their total uh, uh, closing volume, the origin volume, is a drop in a bucket. But again, it's something that you know the consumer and any customer wants. And I think we're going to see a heck of a lot more of when the millennials, who are very comfortable with technology, become active home buyers. Now here is a number that you need to focus on. This is the total amount of dollars invested uh, in the past two years according to this London-based group. Uh, 24 billion has gone into fintech startups worldwide. That is a huge amount of money. Um, the 12 startups that I just showed you a few screenshots of, um, as far as I can track, have done a little over two billion in financing. So that gives you an idea. Okay, where is the other twenty-two billion? What is driving? Uh, uh, what startups are being driven by that money? Uh, now, of course, not all of it is going to go into real estate financing. A lot of them are going into other areas. But again, uh, what happens is that since all financial startups pretty much are you know driving uh, uh, solutions for the financial bottom line is that uh, each startup will deliver a, a solution that inspires other people to either improve their products so uh, in in other words that 24 billion is going to float everyone's boats including the mortgage financing sector um, and and the innovation mill is staggering I put this slide together. I was uh, speaking for Pulte Mortgage uh, on Friday uh, up in uh, Gold, Colorado Springs, and uh, I just thought I'd put this together because this gives you an inkling of, of the fervor that is out there in terms of, 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 of startups. Uh, 1,250 U.S. incubators as of October of 2012, the lowest statistic I could find, but there were only 12 in 1980. So that gives you an inkling, oh my goodness, this is, you know, it's exploded. Seed Accelerator. There's 300 Seed Accelerator programs in the U.S. alone, 
and they have accelerated nearly 6,000 companies, I'm going to say to you it's probably more like 500 seed letter accelerator programs that have probably accelerated in, the, in over 10,000 companies. And the reason I can say that is if you go to the F6S website, you can see that they they uh, uh, have 490,000 startups in their database worldwide, 1.2 million founders and startups total, and uh, and that uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there getting funded by it. And then think about the crowdfunding uh, uh, revolution that's taking place. You know that Kickstarter has funded nearly three million projects. That's staggering if you come to think of it, because Kickstarter is what four or five years old right now. So. Again, and that's just one of the 191 in the U.S., and then there's a hell of a lot more across the world. So, again, you can see that the innovation mill is only going to propel more change uh, in a dramatic fashion because all of these people are focused on, uh, no longer focused on technology-only pain points, but are focused on broad pain points, i.e. Uber for transportation, Airbnb for hotel, uh, you know, fintech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're seeing, uh, we're going to see a lot of upheaval in the market across the spectrum. Now, uh, what uh, what type of tools are they working with? There's a ton, but I thought I'd bring an example of the type of 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 uh, arsenal uh, that a startup might want to dedicate towards a fintech. TensorFlow is an open source software library for machine intelligence, as it says right there on the home page. It's a Google-backed uh, AI library, if you will, and it was uh, open source, and uh, so it was made open source last year, which everybody applauded because now you can apply the same type of techniques that Google uses in, you know, creating Google Maps and its travel search engine online for booking and shopping and what have you, but the first version they released was only capable of running on one web server. The one they just updated, they just announced last week that now it can run on thousands of servers simultaneously, so that gives you what Google, of course, has in-house, which is the ability to put this language to, you, to use on very sophisticated applications with huge amounts of big data points behind it. And it is this type of technology that allows you to roll your own AI application that is in all likelihood going to be used by you know the fintech startups of, of the future because you know open source helps because that means that you get a lot of people, uh, literally an army of programmers and developers helping you improve your particular offering. And uh, you know the advantages are legion. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> the updates are free and fast. Uh, and there's all kinds of customization capabilities that, you, of course, you can add to that code since it's free to use that you can then make it your unique offering. Uh, so those are just the types of things. Again, there's many more. I, I don't have time to sh show them all, but you know, uh, uh, it, it's part and parcel of uh, of the world we live in today. Uh, I'm going to be writing a book about all these Uber trends. I've started. It will be available sometime in the fall of this year. Um, you can also. Uh, if you want to have a quick overview of the Uber trends I presented, you can go to michaelchong.com and you can download this Uber trends infographic. And I think Dave has also made it available on his website, so you can download the infographic. And that gives you kind of uh, uh, this is five Uber trends, uh, including time compression, the acceleration of life, while your orgasm, the I like to watch Uber trend, and the fountain of youth. Uh, you know. Uh, reinventing body, spirit, and environment that I could not talk about here today, but you know, uh, are part and parcel of what will be in the book. And in addition, in the book is the WAF, the woman's acceptance Uber trend, and casual living, the the trend that suggests that you know decorum is uh, is decelerating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, 
I hope that you find this uh, uh, informative. Um, I, I'm certainly able to answer any questions you may have. Uh, you can also connect with me on Facebook or on my page. It's called Michael Chong, and on LinkedIn and Twitter, I am known as Uber Cool. So, be happy to take any questions you may have. All right. So we do have a number of questions that have been submitted. Uh, did first of all, Michael, lots to think about. I I loved you when I saw you um, a month or so ago, and I I got more notes. So I want to unpack a few of these things. Yes. I do want to get to some of the questions. Folks, feel free to keep submitting questions. Do want to let you know that we do have Michael's Uber Trends um, infograph within the control panel, but I just can't recommend it enough. You know, every mortgage coach professional believes in innovation, so connect with him, go to his website, and sign up for his newsletter. I mean, a lot of great content for you to follow. Um, so, so, Michael, let's, let's break down. Let's start with this. You know, we talk about connectivity, convergence, and convenience. Right. Uh, I would like, you know, when I, I spoke at, I uh, was on the panel two weeks ago at the MBA, you know, Mortgage Bankers Association Tech Conference, mm -hmm. and, and there was some discussion about Uber, and I think Uber is a great metaphor for the mortgage industry just because, you know, do you want to be a driver for Uber, or do you want to be a driver for the yellow cab? Uh, you know, we all know who's going to win that war. Uh, so one of the things I want to do, and I made these notes literally while you were talking, because mm -hmm. you talked about Uber, I really wanted to get mortgage professionals to start thinking about with what are you doing today to be connect, to add convenience. Mm -hmm. um, look, first, let's start by dissecting Uber and what right. makes it awesome, and then let's just rift a little bit around how a mortgage professional can execute on this today. So right. here's seven, can you see my screen, Michael? Uh, hold on. Let me see. Yeah, oh, by so the way, for, forgive any spelling errors because I just wrote this down while we were talking. But but from my perspective, Uber makes it easy to make a confident decision. It's easy to order and get started. You have total transparency while the transaction is taking place. The transaction is digital and surprisingly easy. After the transaction, the value, transparency, and accountability continues. Anyways, I'm not going to read it all out loud. First of all, do you agree with these seven points I made, and is there anything else that you would just, off the top of your head, add to the add to the list? Well, yeah, you know, so so let's let's talk connectivity. Obviously, it's connected via the phone, and it's wireless, and it's available at any point in time. So that that is the number one, right? Convergence. What does convergence really mean? Think about a smartphone. A smartphone allows you to do your email. It allows you to check a map, forget directions. It allows you to, you know be a cooking timer, it is convergence exemplified. That's what makes it so powerful. So the same thing goes for, for, for Uber. Uber <laughs> affords you the ability to, you know, order a car, plan your route, do all kinds of things at the same time, and rate your driver. All of those things come with that. And and the, the, the key points that you don't mention here are, are the biggest advantage to the Uber driver and I've asked them all every time I get into an Uber, what do you like about it? And, and inevitably, it is all about having that flexibility, the ability to work whenever you want to. And that is why I always say, what does that mean? Freedom. And what does freedom mean? Control enthusiasm. <laughs> they have more control over their own lives. And that is essentially what it was so very powerful for the driver over working for a cab company because you've got to come in and do your eight-hour stint in one car. So that is a huge thing. The other thing is, and you kind of alluded to it here, is that I rate the driver, and the driver rates me. It's the same thing that eBay offers. eBay allows you to see what a power seller has accomplished in terms of stars. And does he have any, uh, you know, are there any negative uh, reviews of him? And it is that thing, the checks and balances being provided by these platforms are outstanding. So if you think about this, this could easily move over into the restaurant industry where I would be able to actually rate my server based on 
actual service is provided without me having to actually, you know, express my confidence in their abilities by giving them a bigger or smaller tip, which does not really tell anybody else if they're any good or not, including their employer. So these type of disruptive platforms are going to move around, and that's 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 the message here. So yeah, Uber is 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 all of that and more, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So let's let's kind of bring this down to the mortgage space. I mean, we know right. families who are shopping for homes, they have right. mobile devices, they have the MLS yeah. in their back pocket. Yeah. You yeah. know, we know the you know the you know the rocket mortgage, right. the two rates digital mortgages here. Yes. We we know big banks have a mobile phone in the back pocket or purse right. of everyone. So, yeah. so we we kind of know that technology is driving everything and at the same time we have shrinking Profits, right. so so let's bring this to mortgage time and to the industry today. I want to make this as actionable as possible for everybody on this call. Now, there's a lot more to what I call the the digital mortgage triad than just these three things, mm -hmm. but but this is a start. You know where you're. You know I ask everybody on the call whether you're a mortgage professional or whether you're a C-suite executive. You know how easy is it to apply? How digital is it? And can it be tracked from every device? And I mean, this is a big one that I think it's here. And you know, most of the innovations that you see right now, they kind of fit into this bucket. Uh, you know, the other one I see is digital yeah. status. Yeah. Let me let me just go back on that um, for a moment. Yeah, please, go. Um, the, the the implication of of control freakism means simply that if you are in a document processing intensive industry like the mortgage industry, you, you're, you're almost better off having the customer completely uh, monitor the process because all the monies that you spend on customer service, they, they don't really want. They want to be in control of the process. And and again, I uh, you know go on CNBC, watch that national ad. I don't want to talk to anyone. He says control is sexy. Those messages resonate broadly with the consumer base out there, and that is essentially what our industry is going to morph towards. Uh, uh, all of the support will be chat because I don't really want to talk. Even if I talk digitally, it's better than t not talking to someone real time. And that is, you know, the, the store and forward examples of, of texting and all of voicemail, all of these have that advantage that you can send me a message, but I don't have to answer in real time. And that is, I think, the, the huge advantage. And again, that, that also alludes to control over the conversation. And that's what the co consumer wants. They want control over the conversation. So any, any, the, 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 all the processes are going to have to be app-based you know we're moving to a completely mobile world and that is obvious to everybody but again the implications there are one of where uh, it, it, it is endemic on you to allow the consumer to monitor the process and again save you some bucks there yeah no I mean good stuff thanks for helping make this actionable you know the other thing is options you know I mean I I landed in the airport in Seattle a week or two ago I ordered an Uber, and it, it asked me, do you want to spend $17.38 and like 38 cents in share a ride, or do you want to spend $24.36 and, and have your own car? You know, I mean, literally, instantaneously, I had options in a very intelligent way. Right. So when we look at the, the digital triad, and I know there's more to it, but I, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible for lenders today to go, you know, where am I at from an apply standpoint? Where I am at from a status? Where am I at from an options standpoint? Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the options piece is something that we, you know, we're a piece to the puzzle. You know, right. we believe that when a family gets into debt, let's let's give them a digital experience. Let's empower them to make the decision on their mobile devices, whether they come into an office or whether the whole thing is virtual, or even whether it's an open house. You know, if I come into an open house. Give me, give me a digital experience. Give me something that I can walk away with, and still have in my back pocket or my purse. And then, um, also, and then also, straight, stay true to the message. Let's go back to this Uber example. They have become a very powerful force, sixty-three billion dollar valuation. But their key principle 
as far as I'm concerned, is massive convenience, right? And that massive convenience includes not having to tip. Now, right. with the Massachusetts and the California rulings, now tipping is going to become mandatory for Uber, or at least, you know, suggested. And to me, that's a huge deal killer. Not because I don't want to put out a couple of bucks, but because the whole idea was that I could bolt right out of the car, grab my luggage, be gone, not have to get my wallet out and fish for a couple of bucks, and if I don't have it, be embarrassed. And that is the whole, so Uber right now, if they don't address this and, and, and make the tips built in, they're going to kill their business because that is essentially what they're, they, 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 that was the, 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 the huge value that this service provided to us. And, you know, I think that if you attempt to do any type of, you know, seamless mortgage application process, heed whatever your values are and stick to them. I like that. And, well, and I think the other challenge we have in the mortgage space is integrating it into legacy systems. You know, I mean, right. I, I'm going to show real quick, you know, something that we're pretty proud of where we're, we're enabling a loan officer to go from, call it a legacy system, you know, they're pricing a loan and, and integrating what I would just call an Uber-like experience where they can literally, within that platform, communicate with another platform, you know, integrate it and, and literally go from, you know, again, in this particular use case, it's going from pricing a loan to creating a digital experience that's shareable but that's, by the way, Michael, this is the biggest challenge in our industry is we have a lot of disparate systems that aren't right. communicating with each other. Right. Now, we've been investing for years. You know, we've got 20 different partners that will allow for integration and going from legacy systems. But how, how, how long until you see that problem being less of a problem, not just in the mortgage industry, but in all industries, is just all these legacy systems, you know, communicating with each other? Any comments on that? Well, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, I always like to say, needs a giant anima, you know. Uh, they, they are their worst old enemy. Uh, they thrive on complexity. So even, you know, the number one program, program in the world, Salesforce, is also the most hated program among all sales professionals. So you can't have a situation like this. This needs to be reinvented. So Silicon Valley itself needs disruption. Uh, so what we're going to get that because my sense is that the, the, the hundreds of billions that are pouring into startups, someone needs to say, hey, you know, writing code and integrating legacy systems is a massive pain point. What can we do with that? Well, we're seeing some incipient solutions, Docker's being one, um, a Gigster and, and Liquid Talent being, you know, solutions provided by in terms of hiring teams. Uh, but, you know, more needs to be done in this area and I think uh, a lot of the, uh, the the problem with the legacy systems that it was all written in COBOL and basic assembly language and all kinds of archaic uh, architectures that are very hard to reinvent because the code bases are so huge. But my sense is that what you will see in the near future is the ability for uh, organizations to switch some of these uh, uh, legacy systems into more modern, uh, web-based, uh, easier to manipulate data tables that will allow people to more easily and seamlessly integrate their technologies. And that's going to take time, unfortunately, because of the investments in, made into these large code bases. But again, there, there lies the disruption opportunity itself, right? Um, you've got all these people with all of this antiquated uh, architecture having hordes of data. Uh, you know, a startup could come up with a really cool solution that will allow you to tap into that data without having to go to the arcane processes required today. Yeah, so something else for everybody to think about. And Michael, let's go through that article that I forwarded you earlier. But, you know, the other thing I see as a trend is that when you really look at the Uber mortgage experience, it's a combination of technology, processes, and people. You know, one of the other big challenges we have in our space is our technology is, is better than how the people are executing it. So part, right. of, part of the disruption is, is just like as an organization rolling out technology, 
you know, enabling your sales force, enabling your organization with technology that powers processes, but then really requiring the people to implement best practices. And I don't know, I don't know how different our industry is than others, but often we don't we don't manage the people. You know, in our industry, we're like, hey, here's the technology, and then loan officers, you know, kind of do what you want. You know, there's of the of the eight processes you need to follow, there's six or five or four that we really hold you accountable to. And then there's three, four that we just kind of let you do your own thing. Do you right. see that in other industries and as a as a bigger problem? Yeah, there's 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 no industry that's immune for, to the challenges you have. Uh, every sector I've ever addressed has the same issues. Um, some are more progressive on the surface, say like the hospitality industry tends to be more progressive on the surface, but internally they all fight the same wars, and it's all you know part of. Part of the challenge that we have in, you know, the reinvention of technology and the reinvention of training, we don't have a good educational process in the United States, and we don't have a good training process for our employees. We need to retrain our workforce. There's huge amounts of issues that are going to come and rear their ugly head in the next 10, 15 years, and we're going to have to address those. And again, uh, opportunities for startups galore. But at the same time, a lot of that will have to come from uh, our leadership in Washington, D.C., which, as you well know, is absent. So um, uh, we, the mortgage uh, challenges are not unique. Uh, the, 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 the workforce issues and the, and the technology uh, issues are, are just about found just about everywhere. But a, but a massive opportunity for the organization that can reinvent training and education within their culture. And, and drive those best practice experiences. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, totally. so let's, so let's uh, kind of wrap up around, you know, I'm, I'm going to, while we've got a lot of questions, I'm going to end the call with one specific question. But on this article I forwarded over to you, uh, there was a, an article in uh, TechCrunch, you know, why startups can't disrupt the mortgage industry. You know, right. there were some things I really liked about the article. But how would you net out this article? What are some thoughts that came to your mind as you read it? Well, I, the, the minute I saw it, I, I was kind of laughing because I was just about to speak to the Palti Group, uh, and I had been speaking uh, in Was in uh, on Wednesday to the uh, to the Who's Who in, in, in luxury real estate, which is um, that he his his headline didn't exactly match the story. <laughs> the tenor <laughs> of the story was, uh, you know. The mortgage industry needs to do what it does best, which is it has expert people and match it to startups uh, in kind of a quasi-partnership uh, solution. And I think that's 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 a given. That's what has to happen. So to me, all the big mortgage brokers that are sitting out there looking at this industry and saying, "Hey, you know what's happening out there? Our business is changing." They should be thinking about, you know hooking up with one of these 12 startups. That's what I would do immediately if I was them. Uh, because they just don't have the internal culture, and that's what this article talks about, which is they don't have the, the valuation that a digital startup has, and they don't have the, you know, they're being uh, judged by a different type of metric uh, than, than startups. So, you know, obviously they can't, you know, get, you know, spend huge vast amounts of money without any profits on like a startup. <laughs> so, but, but, but his, his, within the fifth paragraph, he says, you know, Rocket is doing a great job, uh, you know, with an innovative solution. So, so it's in essence, the bottom line is, it's, it's not easy to do because you do need the expertise uh, the industry provides, but at the same time, it can be done. And that's, I think that's what this message, this article message is, and, 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 and it's needed. I mean, his, his tenor also about the startups tells you that he says, hey, you know what, the writing is on the wall. Changes are about to occur, and change is good. So uh, anyone that, who's not alert to these, these winds of change is going to, uh, you know, uh, lose out. Yeah, well, I, 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 I hear you on that. The part of the article I like probably best, at least where we're at in the industry today, is disruptive innovation doesn't necessarily require a blank slate. Right. And, but, but one thing we know for sure, it's going to include a better education experience for the borrower. It's going to require more convenience for the mm -hmm. borrower and the experience. And, and you're going to need to leverage technology. So mortgage coaches, you know, hopefully this has been a valuable hour of your time. 
my goal for you is that you're you're driving more clarity for your families with more consistency. You know, the biggest opportunity for you today, if you're an individual loan officer, if you're managing a team, you're managing a branch, it's it's how can I drive consistency within my platform? Uh, mm -hmm. You're obviously already on this call because you believe in Mortgage Coach, and you have these tools, but but are you using them with each and every family, and are you using them as consistently as you can? So, Michael, um, you know, one of the questions was, and I don't necessarily want to predict a year, you know, from my perspective, the question was, what year is it projected that robots will replace the loan officer? Um, you know, I mean, one, part of my answer to that is if you look at Citibank and they're timing a 30% reduction in, in staff, you know, by 2025, you, you can see that it's trending towards a more efficient and automated system. But what, what is your take on, you know, when, let's not talk about when loan officers will be replaced. When will the industry be unrecognizable? Um, yeah. And maybe if you could paint to a couple, you know, five years, 20 years, when, when will the industry be unrecognizable based off of your, you know, analysis of the space? Well, you know, I think that you can generally think about 15-year waves uh, in the industry. Think about the internet, you know, shows up in 95. By 2010, everything is different, right? <laughs> I don't need to tell you that. Uh, uh, I gave you that example of sequence in the genome. 15 years later, you can do it on a map. So I, I'm going to use that as a generational example. So 15 years from today, which is 2031, there's going to be a huge sea change shift in the industry. Whether that will mean complete replacement of a, a mortgage officer, I'm not so sure. But I can tell you that probably by the next wave, another 15 years, which is 46, it will be so. So uh, it, in, in any type of situation where um, uh, businesses have become displaced, you, you need to think about new ways of making money. So when I came up in the industry, um, we were in the incipient stages of the desktop publishing, and the typesetters would come up to me and say to me, you're putting us out of business. Well, not for the next 15 years because, you know, the number of documents output just kept growing, you know, precipitously and it did not, it did not cease. But after that, of course, now we live in the PDF world, who needs to print anything anymore? So the 30-year wave happened. But within the first 15 years, you still have that leeway to do what you want to do. But by, by, by the, ne the next generational wave, you really need to be have a new business in place that makes money in a different way. So let's say that you are right now in a mortgage uh, processing business. Uh, maybe you should think about being a data provider uh, where you take uh, a lot of the data that you process and somehow, you know, uh, able to resell it or do something else with it. Or think about vertical integration where you uh, take over another process. One of the things that I didn't talk about is that um, the, the revolutionary technology behind Bitcoin, even though it itself is a failure, blockchain is one of the most revolutionary financial technologies ever, and it's going to completely disrupt uh, all of us in this industry. Because what blockchain in effect does is that it allows you to say, instead of in God we trust, it is to say in, in proof we trust. And uh, the thousands of computers that are connected to the Bitcoin network use blockchain to add data pieces that are verified by every single server. And that is something that, of course, you can quickly see that applications of these technologies, for example, will make um, sectors of the industry disappear pretty rapidly. Uh, proof sectors, you know, uh, uh, any, anything in the process of selling real estate that requires proof is going to be disrupted by, by this type of technology. So my sense is that 30 years. All right. So, so here's, here's some closing thoughts for mortgage coaches. You know, the one thing I believe in is that stories will never go away. Human beings like to hear stories from other human beings. They like to get strategies. We're still human. Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I love Michael's perspective. It's great to have you as a guest. One thing I know for sure is is using your mobile device in a very strategic way 
it's it's not a good idea, you know, next year, two years from now. You need to be doing it now, today. Be yes. the Uber driver of the industry. So, you know, every Wednesday at night at eleven o'clock Pacific, we do training on how to be a, a mobile mortgage loan officer using our technology. Make sure you come to our next training. Uh, don't miss next Wednesday's call with Jocko. I would say this is a call to invite your realtors to. Uh, it's going to be really special. I'm really excited about it. Also, don't miss next Tuesday's call where I'm going to have um, Danny from the Gaylord Hansen team. I'm going to have Wally. I'm going to have Josh Metals. I'm going to have Kelly Zitlow. I'm going to have you know some of the absolute most successful loan officers in the country. Um, so before you leave, let us know what you thought of today's call. I just launched our poll on a scale of good to great. What did you think of today's call? If you're a guest on this call and you want to learn more about Mortgage Coach, please check the bottom option. You want to demo and learn more. Uh, Michael, thank you for taking so much time to deliver so much value. Uh, it's a great conversation, and you brought, a, you brought a great perspective to it. Thank you very much, Dave. Pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next week. Bye now. Bye-bye.